thank you all for being here. Uh, it's, uh, it's great to see so many new people who are maybe not familiar with Ayn Rand, not familiar with your ideas. And maybe I think what I should do is maybe give you kind of a brief summary of who Ayn Rand was and, uh, you know, maybe just a touch on her ideas before we get kind of into the topic of uh, the relationship of those ideas to capitalism. So I'm just going to give you a brief bio, if you will, but, you know, fast bio of Ayn Rand. Um, Ayn Rand was born in 1905 uh, in Russia to a middle class Jewish family. She literally witnessed the beginning of the Russian Revolution from the balcony uh, in St. Petersburg and uh, lived under the Soviet Union, under communism, uh, for her teenage years. In her early 20s, she uh, managed during a small window of opportunity that Lenin left open to leave the Soviet Union, supposedly to go do research in the United States, but everybody I think knew she would never come back. Uh, and showed up in the U.S. basically with nothing. She had some family members in Chicago that she visited, but then she headed to Hollywood. She was in love with American movies. She loved American film. She goes to Hollywood. The first day in Hollywood, she goes to the Cesar B. DeMille Studios. I don't know if you know who Cesar B. DeMille was, but a famous uh, Hollywood director at the time, producer, director. And, you know, she goes, she has a letter of introduction, and they say, don't call us, we'll call you, you know, brush off. She walks out, and there's Cesar B. DeMille sitting in his big convertible, right? and he's driving by, and she's this little Russian woman, she just, she stares at him, because she has Cesar B. DeMille, big. So he stops the car, and he says, why are you looking at me like that? And she tells him, I'm here from Russia, just, I, I want to know about the movies, I want to work for you. He says, get in the car. Uh, so she gets in the car, he takes her to the back lot of... Uh, oh, it was not like that. <laughs> he took her to the back lot where he was filming The King of Kings, the story of Jesus Christ. And um, he said, well, if you want to get into the movie business, you better know how movies are done. Here's a pass. You know, you can come and watch how this movie is being made. She landed up being an extra on the movie. She landed up meeting her husband on the movie set. And for the rest, for the next 30 years, really, uh, or 20 years, she worked in Hollywood. She worked in Hollywood in the wardrobe department, in all kinds of different odds and ends jobs. But her goal was to be a writer. And she landed up writing scripts for Hollywood. Her first book was We the Living, which was uh, the most autobiographical of her books. It's about life in the Soviet Union. What's that like? It's a wonderful novel. I recommend Recommend it strongly to everybody to read. Um, it was published in the early 1930s in the United States, and everybody said, ah, that can't be what communism is about. Communism is wonderful. We just visited the Soviet Union, and everything's beautiful. Right? This is the intellectuals in New York in the 1930s. Um, so the book did not do well. Uh, she published a little novella called Anthem. Uh, also, didn't, the Americans didn't want to publish it at all. She landed up publishing it in, the, in Britain, in the United Kingdom, a couple of years before 1984. Very much a similar style book in terms of a dystopian, little dystopian novel. Again, highly recommend. In 1947, she came out, 1945, she came out with her, her famous book, The Fountain Cat, which was rejected by 12 publishers. And finally published, uh, they probably, they did a small run of the book, but it caught fire. It became an instant bestseller, word of mouth bestseller. They went immediately into printing more copies. And that was a huge success. She made, she did phenomenally well in the Fountainhead. Moved, she was living in California, she moved to New York. And she spent the next 12 years writing this book in English, not in German. Um, her, really her magnus opus. Uh, which was published in 1957. This time, 12 publishers competed who would get to publish the book. She interviewed publishers to see which one would get it. Immediate bestseller. The amazing thing about this book is it sells more copies today than it did in 1957 when it was first released, which is unprecedented in publishing. That doesn't happen. 
So 50 something years after publication, it's selling more copies than when it was a bestseller. In 2009, Atlas Shrugged sold uh, half a million copies in the United States, which is an astounding number. Um, the book is now translated into every major, every major and minor, many minor languages. I think it's in three different Indian languages. Um, we, we really knew we were successful, and finally, after many, many uh, decades, uh, the French decided to translate it. Uh, so it's now in French since last year. Uh, so we know we've arrived. Um, Ayn Rand then turned, this was published in 57, she spent the 60s and 70s writing nonfiction, writing philosophy. Uh, the essay that uh, uh, the Costa just read from was part of that. Uh, she wrote books like uh, The Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, Not Unknown Ideal, uh, Philosophy Who Needs It, which is the book uh, the Costa was reading, uh, uh, and, and many others. So she wrote philosophy, she wrote commentary on, uh, on current events, she wrote newsletters, she, wrote, she spoke on campuses, she spoke all over the United States, radio, television. If you go to YouTube and you put Ayn Rand's name in, you can see her on Johnny Carson. I don't know how many of you know who Johnny Carson is or remember, but Johnny Carson did late night television and was very, very good. See on Phil Donahue and a number of different shows doing interviews uh, so you get get a little sense in those little video clips of what kind of a what kind of a woman she was. So I, I, I highly recommend that. In addition to reading, um, uh, she died in 1982, uh, and uh, the institute was founded. The Diamond Institute was founded in 1985. Uh, so what's her philosophy about? Uh, Simon believed that, and, and, and you kind of get a glimpse of the questions he asks. So the first question she asks is, where am I? And in a sense, it's a question we all should ask. Where am I? Here. <laughs> I'm in reality. And it's real. Right? So she starts in metaphysics, if you will, by saying reality is what it is. It's real. It's here. And... I don't invent it. I don't make it up. Uh, it's not what I feel like it can be. It's not, you know, primacy of consciousness. It's primacy of reality. Reality comes first. And then the second question was, how do I know? Well, how do you know is because you have a tool for knowledge, which is reason. We know what reality is because we have senses. We have a mind, which is our tool for knowing reality. And we know it. So she doesn't believe in the primacy of emotions or the privacy of, or, or knowledge comes from mystical revelation. No, knowledge comes from our senses and our reasoning mind. Who has reason? Well, you do as an individual. All of us as individuals can reason, have the ability to reason, are competent enough to reason. Now, I'll tell you more about her philosophy in a minute. So I just want to give you that background in a sense to, to clarify kind of the questions that we asked. Uh, but let me get into a free market revolution and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of tie in her philosophy into that as we go along. And if I'm speaking too fast, and let me know if somebody wave at me and say, uh, slow down, you're on a cost and you know, throw something at me. Um, so if we look at history, if we look at the last uh, 200, 250 years, um, one of the things that we, one of the things that we discover is that, that mankind has really, in a very intense, focused way, if you will, run this massive experiment over the last 250 years. We've experimented in which political economic systems work and which political economic systems don't work. And when I say work, what I mean is which systems produce wealth, human well-being, longevity, higher standards of living. So which economic systems produce material well-being really for everybody in those societies? And we've, we've really, over a short historical span, 
managed to try lots of different things for better and for worse. We've tried the closest we've ever come to free markets, to capitalism. Now, when I say free markets, free of what? What do I mean by free markets? Free of, of what? I can't hear you. Free of the state, free of regulations, free of control, free of government. Okay? So a government is not controlling, regulating, manipulating. So we got close to free markets, let's say in the 19th century. And we saw the results. The results for a dramatic rise in standard of living. A massive creation of wealth. Poor people rising into the middle class. During a short span, I don't know if you've, have you ever seen this graph, uh, there's a famous graph of kind of income per capita over human history. And it looks like this. It starts out 10,000 years ago and it, and it goes like this. It's flat and flat and flat. It wiggles a little bit like the Roman Empire and the Dark Ages, but it's basically around $3 a day is what income was for all of human history pretty much until something happens and then it goes like that. Like that. I have to get on my tiptoes to reach, really. Huh? And what that is, is free markets. That turning point is sometime in the late 18th century, I like 1776. America is founded. But what else happens in 1776? What book is published in 1776? Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations was published in 1776. So it's a nice. Nice symbolic date, if nothing else, right? And wealth goes like that. So free markets, we've tried them, and what we get is massive quantities, massive creation of wealth. We've also tried the other extreme. We've tried complete statism. Whether it was communism or fascism, we tried it, and we know the result. Death, destruction, poverty. That's the consequence. You know, we tried communism over many, many years. And we know what happened. You guys know what happened because it happened right across the street, in a sense. Very, very close. <laughs> so we know this extreme. We know this extreme. And then we've tried lots of mixtures in between. Some free markets, lots of statism, lots of control. Lots of controls or, or, or liberty controls, lots of free markets. We've tried kind of all kinds of mixtures in between. And you can plot the results on a graph. And basically, the graph will show you that the more economic freedom you allow people, the greater the wealth, the better the outcome for the poor, the higher the standard of living. And there are indexes like this that are published, and you can plot the graph, and you can see it. So this is the question. If that is true, I think it is, and I think it's pretty evident that it is. Why are we in the West so committed to statism? Why are we in the West so committed to always moving towards more statism and less free markets? Certainly in the United States, this has been a long-term trend for 100 years. The United States used to be pretty free market in the 19th century, and since the early part of the 20th century, it's been moving away from free markets towards more and more statism. And I think we have to ask the question, why? And it's not even that you have to learn history to see this relationship between freedom and economic prosperity. You can see it in the world we live in today if you travel a little bit. If you go to Hong Kong, anybody here been to Hong Kong? You guys should all go to Hong Kong. Once in your lives, you should visit Hong Kong. It's an amazing place. To Hong Kong 70 years ago, it was a little fishing village. 20, 30, 40,000 people lived there. Today, seven and a half million people live on this rock. It's an island. No natural resources. Has nothing on it. Except that when the British took it over, they established the rule of law. They put together, they respected property rights. And they left people alone. And boom, people from all over Asia came there. They swam if they could. They went on rafts. They went on old boats that half sunk just to get to this place. No safety net, no socialized medicine, no, you know, retirement, lucrative pensions, 
nothing promised except they were left alone to be entrepreneurial, to create a business, to build something, and to keep the, the rewards. Seven and a half million people live on this island. GDP per capita, GDP per capita, that's you know, an estimate of their income, their wealth, higher than Germany, equal to the United States. No natural resources, tiny little place. More skyscrapers than New York. And one of the reasons they have so many skyscrapers is because they are wealthy, but also because how do you fit seven and a half million people in such a small space? You have to build high. So you can see the success and you can cross over into China. 30 years ago, if you'd crossed over into China, what you would have seen is devastation. What you would have seen is the consequence of collectivism, starvation, nothing. And then what China did about 1978, 79, 80, is that area close to Hong Kong, they said, this area, we're going to experiment. We're going to leave them alone. We're going to withdraw. We're going to see what happens. And you today cross over from Hong Kong into this part of China, and there's not a big difference. Skyscrapers, industry, people have moved it. From all over China, they've come into this area close to Hong Kong, and it is amazing. Tens of millions of people are now middle class who used to be starving in the fields of rural China. When government steps back and leaves people alone, protects property rights to the extent that China does, respects contracts, rule of law, boom, you get enormous amount of industry, creativity, wealth, standard of living rights. And you can see it with your eyes. This is not hard stuff. More people have risen out of poverty in China in the last 30 years because of free markets where they've allowed them than in any period in human history. Hundreds of millions of people. This is stunning. And yet, we in the West choose to ignore all that, to pretend it doesn't happen. And to grow our governments, and to increase our welfare, and to increase welfare state, and to increase our regulations, and to increase controls, and to limit the sphere of freedom more and more and more in the economic world. And it's not even that we don't understand why markets work. I mean, we do. This is my, my one positive point about Hayek, right? Hayek's a great economist, a fantastic economist. He explained to us how markets work, how prices are such beautiful things that they allow for clearing of supply and demand and how, how all this happens in a beautiful way to create the wealth. So we know this from Von Mises and Hayek and Milton Friedman. There's no shortage of great economists who explain these things to us. So we have the economic facts. We have the economic theory. We have history on our side, those of us who believe in free markets. And we're still losing. If you believe in free markets, you're losing. I mean, China, you might be winning. But here, in the West, where we live, we're losing. So why? Why are we losing? And this, I think, is, 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 is Ayn Rand's, you know, this is where Ayn Rand's philosophy enters. Because Ayn Rand says, it's not about economics. It's not about history. People don't vote their pocketbook. People don't vote what they think will make them money. What people want is to believe that they're good. They want to believe that they're fair, believe that they're right. And there's something about free markets that we find morally, ethically offensive. Wrong. We don't like it. Because what are free markets about? What are markets, any market? What is it about? Well, why does Steve Jobs, wrong idea, use this one. Why does Steve Jobs make one of these? Real question, why does he make it? You can say it. Yeah, but what's, well, how's that reflected? You're jumping ahead. 
What's that? Yeah, he's trying to make money, right? Right? He's trying to make money. These things have huge profit margins. Right? 65% the first iPhone had. A lot of money. But it's not just about money. What else? Why else is it making these? What's that? Competition, but competition is competing to make money, right? But there's more. He, he, Steve Jobs didn't get up in the morning and say, every morning and say, I'm going to go out and make more money. Right? I mean, that's part of it. But that's not what motivated every day to go to work. Why did he do it? Well, that's the outcome. But do you think, I don't think that motivated him that everybody else knows. What motivated him? Create prosperity for other people? You think he got up every morning and said, eh, I want to make I want to make other people better off. I doubt it. I think he had passion for the idea of yeah. new technology. Yeah, he had passion. He loves this. He loved it, right? He loved going to work. He loved creating beautiful things. He loved creating beautifully technological things, right? Beautiful technology. That's what he was about. So for Steve Jobs, this is about money. But more than that, it's also about Passion, beauty, aesthetics, great technology, innovation. But at the end of the day, this is what Steve Jobs about whom? You said it, it's about Steve Jobs. <laughs> this is about Steve Jobs. He made this for himself. I mean, we all benefit from it. And because he wants to make money, he sold it to us. This is about Steve Jobs. Now, when I bought my first iPhone, it was 2008, and the economy was spiraling out of control. We were going down. America was heading towards a recession, and I wanted to stimulate the US economy, so I went to buy an iPhone. Because <laughs> I know all of you go shopping because you care about your fellow man. You want to make sure people have jobs. All those people in the mall, they have to have employment, and if you don't buy stuff, they lose their job. Yeah, right. <laughs> of course not. Right? Why do you go shopping? To make whose life better? Your own. You're going shopping to make your life better. You go shopping to benefit yourself. To increase your productivity by buying an iPhone or to buy nice clothes because you look good. But it's about you. So what's the marketplace about? What's the marketplace about? Buying stuff for yourself, and this guy is selling things for himself. And what is it? So it's all about the pursuit of what? Social well being? Yeah, it's about self interest. Market's about self interest. Market's about people going and selling and buying for themselves. I mean, Adam Smith in 1776 wrote about this in The Wealth of Nations. He said, the baker doesn't bake the bread because he cares about you. He doesn't know you. He doesn't care one iota about you. He bakes the bread to make a living for himself. He might enjoy baking, but he's trying to make money so he can feed his family, he can feed himself, make his life better. And the guy who sells you the bread doesn't care about you. He'll smile. He'll smile because that might increase the sale. But he's not smiling because he loves you. He doesn't know you. So people come into the marketplace, every marketplace, to try to make their lives better for self-interested reasons. Marketplace is a place in which we pursue our self-interest. And yet, what are we being taught about self-interest? For when we were this big, what did our mothers teach us? Self-interest is what? Not good. Yeah, it's not good. Self-interest is not good. It's not moral. It's not just. It's not ethical. Right? What is ethics? What is ethical we're taught? What did our mothers teach us is ethical? Altruism. And altruism means what? Uh, being interested in the well-being of others. Yes, being interested in the well-being of others, but really placing the well-being of others above your own well-being. So giving others the primacy that's what altruism means. It means you should act 
for the sake of other people. And indeed, some philosophers have even said that if you think in your mind, oh, I'm helping this person, I'm going to feel good about it, it doesn't count as it as moral anymore. Because morality is about being selfless, about self-denial, self, you know, making yourself disappear to other people. That's what morality is about. It's about sacrifice. What does sacrifice mean? Giving and getting one in return. Nothing. Nothing. Or something less valuable. The whole point is to lose in a sacrifice. No? I just thought the sacrifice is of control of the religious language and therefore we actually expect something good to happen. Yeah, but again... It's not like, not like a pay to the earth because we do this, I guess, that's kind of silly. But actually we expect... The to go to heaven. <laughs> yeah, we expect... But to the extent that we expect it, the action is not moral. If we do it because we, we want to get something in return, it's not moral. Then we're trading. What's a trade? I give something up and expect one in return. What do you, when you trade, I buy the iPhone. I gave $300, I got an iPhone. Why did I give $300? How much is the iPhone worth to me if I pay three hundred dollars for it? Uh, then you think it's equal. If it was equal, I wouldn't care. But I really want the iPhone, and I'm happy to give the three hundred dollars because the iPhone's worth more than three hundred dollars to me. And when you trade, it's not equal. If you buy a loaf of bread for two dollars, the loaf of bread is worth more than two hundred to you, not exactly two dollars. When I buy the iPhone, the iPhone's worth more than 300 for me. Not exactly 300, I would have gotten out of bed. Right? I had to exert effort. I had to put my hand in my pocket and get the money out. So, I get something more valuable than what I gave up. I gave up $300, I get an iPhone. Apple gets something more valuable than the iPhone. To them, $300 is more valuable than this because they make a profit. So who, so you see the difference between a sacrifice and a trade is in a trade you give up something and you get something more important to you. In a sacrifice, the whole idea is to give something up and not to expect to get anything back. I mean, in the background, there's this religious notion that something good will happen. But if that's the reason, then it doesn't count as good. You have to do it out of a sense of duty, out of a sense of obligation, because it's the right thing to do. And that's what our mothers teach us. So we have a moral system that says be selfless, sacrifice, don't expect anything in return. Do for the sake of doing, for other people. Everything's centered about other people. And we've got an economic system that's focused on what? People pursuing their self-interest. Now you've got a clash there. Those things don't match. Morality says be selfless. Free market says pursue your self-interest. And the morality of selflessness said people who do self-interest is a bad thing, right? Self-interest is bad. It's not moral. So we've got an immediate clash. And what Ayn Rand says is when you have that kind of clash, between morality and between economics. Morality always wins. People vote what they think is right, what they think is good, what they think is noble. And what economics is consistent with the idea of being selfless, with the idea of sacrifice? Well, what does that mean? It means serving others, right? So others might be, they might be poor people who need our help. They need food, they need medical care, they need whatever, right? It's our moral obligation to provide it, but we're too self-interested to do it, 
because we're too busy in the free market doing our stuff, so we're not giving them all the help that we should, according to the morality of selflessness. So the government steps in and says, hey, you guys aren't doing enough. You're not living up to your moral standards. We're going to help you be more moral by taxing you, by taking your money and giving it to them. And we all go, okay, good. Makes me feel good. My taxes are higher. Those people are taken care of. I don't have to worry about them anymore. So redistribution of wealth, the whole welfare state is built on the notion that it's moral, it's just, it's right to sacrifice one group, people who have money, who've created money, created wealth, have a high standard of living, to sacrifice them towards people who don't have. That's what the morality of altruism, the morality of sacrifice, tells us is noble and just and good. So you can't complain about it. We can argue about, you know, how much and so on, but you can't complain about the principle of it because the morality that we all accepted as a culture says it's right, it's good, it's just to redistribute wealth. It would be wrong not to, is what the morality, the moral code would dictate. And if you argue, but look, free markets, they, they, they raise the standard of living higher. It doesn't matter. What's important is what you're doing to help those people. That's what's moral. That's what's noble. That's what's just. So we give up some economic freedom. We give up some economic growth. We give up some economic well-being. We give up on the wealth creation. We even give up on, really, on the poor of doing better, all in the name of sacrificing one group for the sake of another group. All in the name of what we think is moral and just and good. So I believe that the whole welfare state is based on a morality of altruism, on this morality of sacrifice. That's the, that's the fundamental. That's why it's so appealing, it why it grows, it why it never goes away. But it's not just the redistribution of state. It's also the regulatory state that I think is based on this morality. The controls, the regulations, the dictate to you how to run your business, what kind of business you can open, when you can open it, how you do it, who you can employ, when you can fire them, all of that is regulations. Now, why do we have a regulatory state? Well, think about the notion we have of free markets. In free markets, we understand that the businessman is self-interested, right? Steve Jobs is self-interested. It's about making money. He's about his own passion and love for the product, right? So he's self-interested, but what also do we associate with self-interest? So it's bad. But in what way is it bad? What do we associate with? What behaviors do we associate with people who are self-interested? What do they do? Why is it bad? It's not just that they don't care about other people. What, what do they do to other people? Exploit them. Yeah, they exploit them. So in our mind, self-interest is connected to the idea of exploitation, of lying, stealing, cheating, Doing whatever it takes to get you away. Taking advantage of other people. Bad stuff. So we have self-interest associated with exploitation, with lying, with stealing. Just being bad. And self-interest associated with businessmen. And the two merge. And our whole conception of businessmen in the West, at least in America, every businessman is a crook. And my mother also taught me this, by the way. She said, nobody makes a million dollars without cheating, lying, and stealing. They're all crooks. Because clearly businessmen are self-interest. Clearly we've been taught that self-interest is lying, cheating, stealing, being a crook, being exploitative. The two are the same. And what do we have to do if we know a whole group of people are really crooks? What do we do? We need to watch them. We need to try to control them. We need to make sure they don't have opportunities to screw us. Right? So I, I like to give the example. In the United States, you walk into an elevator. Right? And on the elevator, on the wall, there's a little diploma. And the diploma says, this elevator was inspected by a government bureaucrat. It won't fall and kill you. And I go, that's good. 
Because in a free market, people who built elevators would build lousy elevators that kill their customers. Right. Because the way to make money in a free market is to kill your customers. We laugh. But that's the assumption behind most regulations. Why do we have food inspectors? We have food inspectors because we believe, we all believe this, that if we didn't have food inspectors, McDonald's would poison us. They already are. <laughs> they would poison us because the way for McDonald's to make money is to make us all sick. I mean, that makes no sense. But it's what we believe. If we didn't have labor regulations, every employer would tie his employees to machines and whip them three times. That's what we believe. That's how you get the most productivity out of people, right? That's how you make money off of people is by whipping them. So we need the government inspectors to come and the government regulators to come to protect those poor employees from those mean, nasty, self-interested, line-stealing SOBs of businessmen. So our perception of morality, our perception of morality guides our perception of economics. If we believe those people need to be taken care of and it's a moral obligation, it's a moral duty, it's a moral imperative, then it's fine to sacrifice some other group in order to facilitate that help. And then if we look, if we look at people, if we conceive a businessman as self-interested, and we have already conceptualized self-interest as a bad thing, then these people must be bad. So we have to control them, we have to regulate them, we have to look over their shoulders on everything that they do. And that's the regulatory state. And that's statism, right? That's the modern state. Redistribution and regulation. And both are driven by this morality of altruism. And what happens to the people, to the psyche of the people themselves who engage in this process? Because most people in the world, in the Western world, I mean, they live their day-to-day -day lives how? Altruistically or self-interestedly? What, I mean, what dominates? Day-to-day, -day. what's that? Yeah, most of us live our lives, we're trying to make money for ourselves, we're trying to buy nice things in the store. We're trying to have a decent life, a nice life, a good life, right? And yet, in, in particular, think of businessmen who are really out there trying to make money and trying to succeed and do well. And yet, what are we taught that is good is selfless, right? Sacrifice. And what happens when you live one way, but you're taught that you should live another way? And you believe that you should live another way? What emotion does that create inside? Guilt. 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 And guilt is an incredibly powerful way to control people. To get them to agree to be regulated. To get them to agree to be sacrificed. Because they feel guilty. This is good. An American, in America again, which is where, where I know, businessmen all feel guilty. And the more successful they are, the more guilty they feel. The older they are, the more guilty they feel. I, I attended once this award dinner, Lifetime Achievement Awards, in Charleston, South Carolina. This is one of the most conservative places in America, so you can't blame these guys for being leftists, right? Very conservative. And they read these long bios of every businessman who got this achievement, a big, big deal. And the first minute, first minute of the biography is their business achievements. You know, the companies they built. The next nine minutes of their introduction, their community service and charity. That's guilt, guys. These guys spend most of their time on their business. Most of their achievement in their life is around business. They built something. They created something. They employed people. They changed the world in which they lived. Through their business. We all do through our business. It's where we really contribute to our lives, to making our lives better, but also to other people. We employ them. We trade with them. We change the world when we do business. And yet they get zero moral credit for it. Indeed, they get negative moral credit. They feel guilty about it. So they go out and have to do community service and charity. 
Not because they love community service and charity, but because it reduces their guilt for being profit-seeking businessmen. And there's nothing wrong with community service and charity. It's just not that important. It doesn't build economies. It doesn't build societies that create anything. It helps a few people here and there. Fine. I'm not against it. But that's not where you get your, 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 your value as a human being. That's not what's important to life. It's what you build. It's what you create. It's what you make of your own life that's important, you would think. I mean, I like to give the example of, you know, the United States in 1776 was a third-rate colony. The British almost didn't fight. It wasn't that important. By 1914, it was the strongest industrial military force on the planet. That didn't happen because of charity and community service. It happened because of business. It happened because of production. It happened because people went out there to make money, to be self-interested. And poor people from all over Europe, many, many, many Germans, emigrated to America. And generally, the people who left Europe to come to America were poor and ignorant and uneducated. My ancestors, the Jews, were all poor, ignorant, and uneducated. Yes, they were. They were from the little shtetls in Poland and Russia. They knew nothing. And they worked hard. And they built something, and they succeeded without any safety net, without anything, without the state providing for them, without anything, just because they were willing to work hard. They were willing to invest in what they were doing. So Ayn Rand, what Ayn Rand says is that that is what's driving the world. This morality is what's killing the world. It's what drove us towards collectivism, it's what drove us to those regimes that were anti-capitalist or the opposite of capitalism. It's what drives us away from free markets. And it still, to this day, prevents us from embracing capitalism fully, embracing free markets fully. Morality drives our behavior. And she says what we need to do is reject that morality. Not because of economics, but because of a key question. Why is your life less important than other people's lives? Why should you sacrifice for those in need? Why is their need a claim against you? Why does their need require your sacrifice? What is it about you that's not as good as them? And she says that's completely upside down. The whole point of morality should be, she says, to teach us how to live, how to succeed, how to be happy, how to flourish, how to prosper. In that sense, she harkens back to Aristotle. Aristotle, whose whole moral theory is about how does individual human beings achieve flourishing? How do you achieve success? How do you achieve happiness? That's what morality should teach us. Not how to diminish ourselves, not how to live for other people, but how to live for ourselves. So Rand's whole morality, moral code, is about self-interest. What is it? How do we achieve it? How do we use the values? How do we pursue the values that will lead us towards success and towards happiness? So she rejects the whole notion of altruism as a moral code. The whole idea of living for other people, she rejects. The purpose of life is to live for yourself. It's to be happy. It's to be successful. It's to prosper. It's to flourish as a human being. And then really the question then is, what leads to that? What kind of value should I pursue to make myself happy? What are the values that we as human beings should pursue to lead to success. It's not automatic. We don't know how to be successful automatically as the history of the world suggests to us. There's nothing automatic. We have to figure this stuff out. And what is the tool for figuring it out? 
What is what makes, what is it that makes us uniquely human? What is it that provides us with the knowledge to live a good life? Well, as, you know, as a, as a purely physical animal, we're pretty pathetic. If you look around the room, we're slow, we're weak. We have no fangs, we have no claws. We're just physically not up to the task of living outside. So we build buildings. We build computers. And we design clothes. And we develop sophisticated mechanisms to get us food. And how do we do that? What's the tool that allows us to do all of that? Education. Education is a step forward, right? What's that? Knowledge, yes. But what is the tool that we want to explore? Yeah, a reason. Ultimately, it's our reason that leads to knowledge. We have to open our eyes. We have to see. We have to observe. We have to be willing to look. In the, in the example there, we have to be willing to look at our instruments. We have to be willing to look at the sky and to the aliens and to figure it out. And to decide, to judge, are they friendly? Are they not? Are the instruments working? Are they not? Is the sky, the earth sky, or is it an alien planet? We need to be willing to look. We need to be willing to engage our minds. We need to be willing to think. And only thinking people can get an education. Only thinking people have knowledge. Knowledge comes from thinking. And that leads to innovation. I mean, think about, think about the clothes you wear. Where do clothes come from? <laughs> Where did clothes originally come from? Well, today they come from Bangladesh, yes, yes. yes. People actually working for a living and producing our clothes today. But, but who invented clothes? Some person 10,000 years ago figured out that when you skin an animal and you treat the leather in a particular way, you can create clothes. But he was a genius and he used this. We don't have the gene for making clothes. We need to use our minds to figure out how to make clothes. Somebody had to build factories, even in Bangladesh. And I know you think the people in Bangladesh are being exploited for making our clothes. Well, some of you might, some of you might not. But the people in Bangladesh are making these clothes as a trade. You might think it's a bad trade, but that's easy for us in the West to sit back and think that they are making a bad trade. But they're engaging in a trade. They're giving up their time. They may be even risking their lives to work in some of those factories. They are risking their lives, right? But they're getting something in return. And that something in return is worth the risk for them. Otherwise, they wouldn't do it. They could go back to the farm. Yes, they could. It's a lousy life, but that's my point. These are alternatives they face. They're not your alternatives. They're not my alternatives. But the alternatives they face in Bangladesh are they could go back to the farm, which is lousy, or they could work in a factory that's also lousy. But the factory is slightly better than working on a farm, so they're willing to work in the factory. What we want to do in the West is make it so expensive to build a factory in Bangladesh that nobody would buy it, nobody would build it, and they'd have to go back to the worst lousy condition, which is on the farm. And it won't matter to us. We'll pay a few more cents for our clothes. We'll still be middle class and we'll be comfortable and we'll be pleasant, but those people will die. Much more than what they're dying in factories. They'll die of starvation in the farm. They're making a choice and you want to tell them how to live. Trade is choices. We might not understand some people's choices. We might not even agree with some people's choices. It's their choices. Nobody put a gun to their back. If somebody had, that's immoral, that's wrong. So back to, uh, back to where we get our values, reason, our mind. So for Ayn Rand, for Ayn Rand, morality is about thinking. Morality is about using your mind, using your reasoning mind to figure out how you should live what you should do, what success means for you, how to flourish in this world. It's about being rational. So she talks about rational self-interest, 
rational egoism. But she also says the only kind of egoism is rational egoism. The only kind of self-interest is rational self-interest. Because it's never in your self-interest just to do stuff out of emotion, out of whim, out of the moment. Because your emotions are not tools of cognition. This goes back again to why we need philosophy. Your emotions won't tell you if you're on the right planet or if those things are aliens or they're people. You need your mind to be able to do that. So it's not about happiness. It's not about high. It's not about snorting the cocaine. It's about lifelong achievement. It's about lifelong flourishing. That's what leads to happiness. So Rand is for rational self-interest. And what is the enemy of reason? What is the enemy of the human mind? Emotions are not Emotion are not exactly an enemy, right? Because emotions, A, you control and you can change. You can change emotions. You've never changed your emotions? Have you never fallen in love with somebody and then fallen out of love with them? Sure. Sure you do. I'll give you an example. Maybe it didn't happen exactly in your case, but sure. You fall in love with somebody and they cheat on you. You get a new fact. It takes a little while for that fact to get absorbed into your system and your emotion change. You don't love them anymore because they're a cheating SOB. But that's because you got a new piece of information to your reason, to your rational faculty, your emotions change. All of our emotions, at the end of the day, are products of conclusions that our mind has come to, rationally or irrationally, it's come to. And when we change those conclusions, it takes a while, it's not instantaneous, it can take months, it can take years. It takes a while, but if you change the conclusions, the emotions change as well. And if you really think about it, you can figure out examples from your own life where that has happened. Because we're not born with the same emotions, just run with the emotions the rest of our life. And our emotions are not some serious thing that we don't know where they come from. They come from here. Maybe we don't remember the conclusions that we concluded that result in these emotions. But they're not arbitrary. They're not just out of nowhere. They have reasons. And if you want to be a good person, my view is, figure out where your emotions come from. If, if we had really good psychoanalysis, right, really good psychology, that's what they would be focused on. Helping you discover the source of your emotions. Because sometimes it's hard. Because sometimes it happened in childhood or whatever. But it's not causeless. It's a product of reason. So I don't believe emotions are the enemy. Indeed, I think the more reasoned you are, the more you rely on your reason, the more you rely on your mind, the more you integrate your ideas, the more consistent your emotions are with your thoughts. And emotions are great. It's how we live. Love emotions, right? It's passion. It's excitement. It's, it's love. It's how we express our life. We live through our emotions. But emotions are not tools of cognition. But what, what can other people do to destroy our ability to reason, to destroy our ability to think? What can other people do to that? They can put a gun to our head. They can coerce us. If I put a gun to your back and say, from now on for you, two plus two equals five. And every time it equals four, if any time it equals four, in your mind, I'm gonna shoot you. You can't produce, you can't build, you can't make, you can't program a computer. Coercion is the enemy of thought. Coercion limits your possibilities. Coercion tells you that you can't do certain things. You can't go in those directions. You can't look. You're not allowed to look. If you look, I shoot you. Reason demands that you look. Reason demands that you tear down boundaries. Reason demands that you investigate all options. But coercion limits, controls. So Ayn Rand believes in free markets, not just because they produce a high standard of living and it's good, but because free markets are the only kind of markets consistent with human reason. They're the only markets in which there is no coercion. And if there's no coercion, we unleash 
the human mind. We unleash our ability to be innovative, to create, to produce, to think. And that those are the ideal conditions for human success, because human success is dependent on human reason. So she was an advocate for capitalism because she was an advocate for individual self-interest. But she was an advocate of individual self-interest because she's an advocate of reason, of our capacity to think as man's basic means of survival. This is how we survive. This is how we thrive. This is how we succeed. So what Rand really urges, I think, all of us is, at the end of the day, is to live our lives for ourselves, to make the most of our lives, not to waste them, not to live for other people. Doesn't mean you're not nice to other people. Doesn't mean you're not, you don't help them. It doesn't mean you don't certainly doesn't mean you don't defend them. It means your focus is on you. And it's often in your interest to help, to befriend, to assist. But it's because you want to, because it's consistent with your rational values. The whole idea is happiness, flourishing, success as a human being. And whether you agree with a particular you know, values and virtues, the important thing is to focus on what leads to human happiness. So I encourage you to read Rand, in particular, if you're interested in this idea of morality, she's got a wonderful book called The Virtue of Selfishness, which you could say the virtue of rational selfishness if you really wanted to, but she believed selfishness was rational, had to be rational. Any other type would not be selfish. Where she elaborates on this. So her focus is on living the best life that we can live. And she's pro-capitalism because that's the only system that allows us to do that. It leaves us free to do it. It leaves us free to flourish our full potential. Thank you all.